Hello, and welcome to the latest in our 2016 series of useful webinars from the Payments Knowledge Forum, all leading up to our two-day annual conference in London on October the 3rd and 4th, which I hope you will also be able to attend. You can find more information about the conference, our webinars, up-to-date payments industry news, and useful links on our website at thepkf.org. I'm Dennis Whitley of the Payments Knowledge Forum, and with us today we have Mark Collins, General Manager of TNS Payments Division in the UK and Ireland. Mark has over 30 years experience in the payments industry, working in a variety of service operations and IT management roles for Bank of Ireland before joining TNS in 1999. He has an excellent understanding of technical solutions, primarily from a commercial perspective. And to support him today with more in-depth technical knowledge, just in case any of you decide to ask some really tricky questions, we also have John Cole, who is Senior Manager, Technical Solutions and Services at TNS, where he has worked for over 20 years. In addition to his day job, John's also on the organizing committee for the Payments Knowledge Forum. During the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, which we'll try to take perhaps during the presentation or at the end. On the right of your screen, you should see a small control panel where you may type in any questions that occur to you as you listen. We'll try to get through as many as we can during the time available. The whole event will be recorded in MP4 format. and A link will be sent out by email tomorrow. and will also be available through the pkf.org so you can review it at your leisure or share it with your colleagues. In today's webinar, uh, the focus is on point-to-point -point encryption, a major issue which very few organizations have yet to get fully to grips with. To explain just what's involved and how to achieve P2P validation, it's my pleasure to hand you over to Mark and John. Mark? Dennis, uh, thank you very much for your kind words, 30 years seems like an awful long time, but it doesn't quite feel like that. Uh, to all the attendees, many thanks for taking the time and trouble to attend. Uh, I think it's an indication, the number of attendees, as to the interest in point-to-point -point encryption. Uh, and we look forward to sharing our thoughts on what we have seen, what uh, experiences we have picked up in our conversations and in the services that we provide. The audience comes from many different countries, in fact, well beyond Europe into the US and the Caribbean. And again, I thank you all for taking the time. Uh, we also have attendees from all aspects of the payments value chain, from retailers and merchants uh, all the way up to acquirers. We do indeed welcome questions, uh, but I would ask you, rather than asking during the presentation, albeit Sorry, you may of course ask during the presentation, but we will deal with the questions at the end of the presentation itself. So, our intention today uh, is to talk about how anybody can seek to achieve point-to-point -point encryption validation. Just a quick overview on what P2PE actually is. To say that it's a complex standard is, is a gross understatement. Uh, the PIM, or the P2PE instruction manual, uh, is about 1,300 questions or standards that need to be attained. It's been a hot topic for three to four years now, and our research shows that of the 900 PSPs across the globe, 20 at this stage have achieved a validated status. And I think that's an indication of itself of how difficult it is. We are not aware of any tier one merchant having achieved the certification or the validation. So there certainly has been a lot of talk and perhaps not enough action. Point-to-point -point encryption is not just about encryption. In fact, when you look at the effort associated with achieving all 1,300 questions within the PIM, a very small proportion of them actually relate to the encryption method itself. Point-to-point -point encryption is about controlling the asset, the logistics, and all elements of the chain of custody. I've mentioned the complexity of the PIM, uh, and it, it is a very onerous document when you see it and when you go through it, but it is the key foundation 
to achieving the standards that are required. P2PE has had two different versions. The first was issued in 2011, uh, and it allowed or required that there be a single solution owner responsible end-to-end, -end, even if there were partner components. Version 2 was issued in the late part of 2014 uh, and still requires a single owner, but does allow for individual components or zones to be individually validated. Today, we're going to focus on two specific questions. What does a merchant or acquirer with a terminal estate need to do to achieve the validation? And secondly, why would anybody want to? What benefits are there in doing so? I'm going to start with the second question first. There are tangible and intangible benefits associated with achieving the validated status. Tangibly, you have the ability to reduce scope in PCI attainment and therefore reduce costs around IT and other personnel. You definitely reduce your fraud risk. You're exposing yourself to less fraud opportunity because your, your systems and services are validated as being robust and effectively best in class and you definitely have an opportunity to reduce your acquiring fees because from an acquirer perspective a lot of the cost is around managing risk if you are reducing risk by bringing a validated solution to the party you have the opportunity to fight for lower uh, um, merchant service fees in terms of the less tangible or totally intangible benefits data protection you're firstly securing your data in the most effective way you possibly can. You're protecting your reputation, the reputation of your business and the reputation of your brand. And you are avoiding fines because fines will manifest themselves if you expose card data to the wider public. How do you do it? So let's start with a, a preparation phase in terms of looking at the point of interaction point of interaction typically being a standalone terminal or a PED. PCI is the master standard that everything should adhere to. The payment application must adhere to PADSS and the hardware must attain at least PTS level 3 and obviously subsequent at 3.0 and later. Encryption has to be included uh, and typical standards are BPS, uh, triple DES or, or similar, some being proprietary to certain terminal types. In an ideal world, remote, remote key download is available, but as a minimum, keys must be injected in a secure facility, uh, and later we'll talk about the, uh, the control of the device through the, uh, the, the, the full chain of command. Apologies for the delay. Into the delivery phase, in terms of the requirements for moving the device from the central location into the field, you must have full accountability and traceability the whole way through the chain of custody. Sign-in procedures must be rigidly checked and adhered to. Tamper checks through tamper-proof bags and seals must be sealed at time of delivery and inspected at time of receipt. All movements, all activities must be evidenced and must be available for further checking at subsequent stages. And this happens through all stages of the installation process, all the way from the key loading through the transportation into the shop for the engineer to work on, through to being set live, and then obviously there are subsequent checks when the store is up and running in a validated environment. Devices, of course, move having been installed in the first place because they do break down. Uh, they do need to be taken from one store and moved to another in the event of a change in, of environments. Uh, and the same chain of custody rules apply in terms of all those movements. 
if the device, for whatever reason, requires fresh keys, well then the whole installation process must be repeated again. And merchants must be able to track where every point of interaction is at all times. So a very clear inventory of all the devices, where they are at any given point in the equation, must be available in a validated environment. We talked a little earlier about the PIM, and the template is available online. I've mentioned it's an onerous effort and that there are 1,300 requirements to complete it. Completion drives the gap analysis and the action plan, and the, on, the, the honest and accurate completion of the PIM is critical to the success of any program. To me, it's a little bit like cheating in the school exam. It'll work for a while, but it'll catch you out later on. Further preparation through the validation phase is uh, map out your own PED uh, device supply chain and all the associated processes. Use diagrams. How does it work within the supply chain and within the store? And understand the, cap understand the encryption methods because this is key to your success in terms of being of suitable standards. You must maintain a device inventory. You must know how many devices you have, where they are located at any given time, and account for every movement to ensure that any activities associated with them has been done in a compliant fashion. Drafting the initial PIM, you must engage a QSA having done this. Create your gap analysis and understand where you are versus the standards and where you need to be and what you're going to do to get to that compliant, validatable standard. Some of these, device, some of these requirements will be under your own control. Some of them will be within your supply chain. You as the owner are responsible for all of them. You must work with your supply chain and all of its participants to ensure that they are meeting the standards. If they are validated, in terms of the zone validation themselves, you may take their certification and use that as part of your validation process. But ultimately, you are responsible for their activities and their compliance with the validated standards. As in all chains, you are only as secure as the weakest supply member in the supply chain. In terms of the validation program itself, you need to manage all of your own internal processes, the chain of custody, the encryption and decryption methods, card data storage, where and how, how are you going to encrypt it, and consider the internal versus the outsource. We all know how separation is the best rule in terms of maintaining the security, but that can bring significant business challenges. A few points to consider in this regard. Your finance team within a merchant environment or within an acquirer environment will always need to be able to access card data to satisfy law enforcement requests. Those of you familiar with the Patriot Act in the States will know how onerous that is. Uh, that payment data has been key to activity of a criminal and of a terrorist nature. The law enforcement Authorities will not be slow to ask you for this, and rules will differ from country to country as to how quickly you must respond. But this is a fact of life where we live, and it's going to become more than likely an increasing fact of life. Within your own business, you'll need to figure out who else needs it. Your marketing team may use it, because this may be the only method that they can identify where your cardholders, your customer, has used different elements of your service. So consider a customer uses the same credit or debit card to use both your uh, e-commerce channel and your face-to-face -face in your store. Your marketing team have no ability to link those two behaviors and those two activities. At least within a, a, a payment device, if the same card is used for both applications, 
well then you can tie the two activities together and create a much more robust understanding of your customer behavior and use that data in whatever means you need to to grow your business. Similarly for the dashboard in terms of managing the business, we all know when we're running a business that we need to know what's driving our activity and what's driving our profitability. Similar to the marketing, uh, this is a, a, an ongoing business need to understand what is driving the sales activity within your business. The only way you can see this is through the data that you are trying to secure and trying to encrypt and keep us away from as many hands as possible while also meeting your business needs. So in terms of point-to-point -point encryption, who does what? One option is to outsource to a single validated provider, typically a PSP, uh, which from a theoretic point of view absolutely works. However, I do think it presents some business challenges. Firstly, you're losing the control and losing the ability to innovate because you're working in a shared environment and you're typically co-housed with competitors. Anything they do for you, they're doing for your competitor. So your ability to innovate is reduced. I think the other aspect is scale. We know how few of the global PSPs are actually validated at this stage. Equally, we know that a lot of them in their size would not be as big as a significant merchant in terms of the volume of data, the volume of payment transactions that they are handling in any given period. There is not any proven solution where a tier one merchant is using uh, a PSP service. And it's something that, of course, is doable. It's a scalable activity, but it hasn't been done yet. So our view is that it's a little ahead of its time and perhaps may, may happen in the fullness of time. If you do run your own host as a merchant, there are a lot of factors to consider. You've got to consider the manufacturer in terms of the point of interaction device. You've got to consider all of your supply chain, the store network itself, and you've got to consider the sourcing considerations in terms of the obligations on all of those providers. The last thing you want to have is a situation where one of your suppliers is incapable of meeting the standards that are required of you as a validated solution because they don't have it on their roadmap or have uh, no longer provided in a validatable fashion. It will severely weaken your business. You have to take control. We talked earlier about evidence and this is something that we, we each have to think of because you do need to uh, validate, but you also need to uh, subject yourself to regular and frequent audits and evidence is the key to show that you are adhering to all of the standards that you adhere to when you were uh, validated in the first place and how are you, you are ensuring that your environment is being maintained on an ongoing basis in that validatable way. The tier one approach, we talked about who does what in the context of the PIM and the gap analysis and essentially that's with you within your own business. You then have to work with your QSA to clearly understand the gap analysis. Within your own business, you need to have a working group across all of your own business functions and across your supply chain. Again, all of these have to continue to work through the whole program because they each have to sign up to each element. It certainly needs significant business support. Within your own business, you must have senior management, even board level approval because while there will be a significant amount of work that your own team and your supply chain will be signing up to and no doubt a significant amount of cost, it is equally understood that there is a significant amount of benefit that will stay with you for the life of your validated solution. So the upfront investment, while substantial, both in terms of uh, checks to be written uh, to third parties such as QSAs and, and uh, your, your other functions, it delivers a very significant saving and benefit to your business in the longer term all part of the business case that needs significant senior executive sponsorship. 
our experience of the main components and what can get missed. Encryption, your encryption method and your key injection method. Does the host you use support remote key download? These methods are absolutely critical as to what your ultimate solution is going to look like. But remember, we did say that we figure that the actual encryption components of a validated solution might only account for between 10 and 20% of your effort in terms of uh, getting yourself to a validated state. The PIM, I've talked at length about this, and, and I really describe it as the foundation to the whole plan. If your PIM is weak, if your gap analysis is inaccurate, if you are in any way dishonest, either in terms of the, the, the gap, the, the PIM itself, or the gap analysis and its execution, you will not be successful because through the validation phase or subsequent to that, one of your processes will fall down and you will not maintain your validation or worse, worse you will suffer a breach. We talked already about the supplier and the supply chain management. Uh, they must adhere to your approved methods. The whole solution must be capable of validation end to end. You must have the contract protection, as I've already alluded to, and it's evidence, evidence, evidence the whole way through. P2PE is not particularly technical. It is primarily operational, and it's primarily around the management of your inventory and of your suppliers and the movement of that inventory. Final thing you must think. Do you really need to do all of this in-house? Do you work with a trusted partner? And there are many good partners out there. But needless to say, within TNS, uh, we believe we can add value and we, we, we would be delighted to help. Thank you. And uh, while I've been talking, uh, I've had no time to look at any inbound questions, so I'll ask John to help me in that regard now. Uh, the views that we've expressed there are based on our experience. Uh, we see significant cost, but we also see very, very significant benefit. John, any questions coming in do you want to kick off with? Thank you, Mark. Yep, uh, we've had a couple of questions in so far, and the first one I, I think is for you. And it is, what is your view on Tier 1 merchants selecting P2P validated PSPs as their way of going forward? to get away from managing payments altogether. Yeah, I, I, I touched on this in the presentation and, and I think I can, I can elaborate. Um, we see the benefit of working in a PSP environment, but we also see the downsides. And the most significant downsides that I alluded to in the presentation uh, were the fact that you're losing that ability to control your own environment and to innovate. Our experience with working with Tier 1 merchants in particular is that no two of them operate or behave in exactly the same way. There are many common factors to what they sell and how they sell it, but every store in our experience, in terms of how they manage their inventory, how they clear out their inventory, how they manage their selling process, how they interface with their other channels, each store is entirely different. So we think that within the PSP environment, there is that requirement to standardize and depend on the PSP capabilities rather than developing solutions that really are absolutely tailored to meet your own business needs and your business aspirations. The second point I made when we were presenting uh, was that I don't believe that PSPs could readily take on a series of tier one merchants in their current guises. Uh, I have no doubt that this will change over time. Uh, we believe it's still several years away, uh, and that scale will come, but at this point in time, we think the, uh, the market is just uh, not quite ready for it yet. In the multi-channel environment, it, it, it obviously is in early days. Uh, we know that merchants want to be able to track their customer behavior and interface with any aspect of their delivery chain, of their selling chain, whether it's face-to-face -face in a store, through a call center, or whether it's an online purchase. Uh, some stores are doing that extremely well. I think most are struggling with it. 
and we think the PSP environment would, would, would further hinder that. Okay, thank you, Mark. We've got another question, and it is, any recommendations on selecting a good QSA? Are they all the same? Are they all qualified to the same level and able to deliver the same quality of service? Uh, I'll pick that one up, it's a good question. Uh, when it comes to P2PE, um, you actually need a specialist QSA, and he's called a, a P2P QSA. And to answer that, yes, they, they have to qualify. Typically, uh, a P2P QSA comes from um, a PCI QSA background, uh, but they do have to do a specific P2P test. And so essentially, yes, they're all qualified to the same standard, and they should all deliver the same quality of service. Um, obviously, some of you would be familiar with the, the, the major players like Trustwave, um, who we use particularly, and they do deliver good service. We use them to do PCI, DSS as well. And that's it. So on to the next question. In your experience, how frequently does a P2P solution need to be revalidated, and do you have a view on the mandates required? Again, uh, that's one I'll pick up. Um, I believe you have to revalidate every three years. Uh, in terms of the work required, um, like PCI, it's really an ongoing process, something you should be look to do continually over the years. So you have to do your penetration and vulnerability tests and things like that. Um, in terms of cost, uh, QSAs are very expensive, as are pen test people. It's a cost that a lot of people tend to forget about. Um, your average pen test, if you go out there and get a, an ethical hacker to come in, will cost you in the region of £15,000, maybe more, every year. And then the ongoing compliance. Um, typically, how we do it within TNS is we have a, a dedicated dedicated PCI compliance team who do nothing but do continuous audits. They will look at all the network elements, they will look at the processing elements, they will look at the host elements, and they do that as a continual process throughout the year. So ultimately, we know the cost, but the cost of senior management in terms of the auditors and so on, that can run into hundreds of thousands. And it's typically something that's forgotten about. Okay, other questions? Okay, I've got another one that's come in. In respect to the chain of custody of the points interaction, which we call PEDS, what special considerations are required for mobile payment devices? And that's a, a quite a difficult one, to be honest, which I haven't come across at the moment. Typically, uh, what we're using is in-store devices. You could, in theory, have a, a mobile device, but at the same time, that should still have the same keys as any fixed terminal will have on it. So in theory, you shouldn't require any additional security because it is a point-to-point -point encryption. So in terms of a, a mobile di device, it should be treated exactly the same as just a, a fixed device or PED, which you see in a normal store. Okay, do you have any more questions there, Mark? I see one there. Let me try and answer this. Uh, you mentioned in the presentation about the savings that P2PE can bring to large merchants. Can you share what type of savings you are hearing about? Uh, this is a slightly subjective question, but, but let me talk about some of our own experiences in terms of some of the merchants we've been working with. Uh, the overall value or the benefit to the business on the tangible side in terms of cost reduction through the life of the validated business case uh, is between 750,000 and a million and a half US. That was the number that was uh, shared with us by, by two particular tier one merchants. Um, that of course does not take account of any of the intangible benefits in terms of you know, how do you put a value on your brand damage as we have seen with some of the breaches, particularly in the US, uh, where they have been able to measure the impact on their business, uh, particularly on the, uh, the e-com side. But uh, that, that's the best estimate that we can come up with in terms of what costs you can save either through what you don't have to do through a subsequent PCI validation phase 
uh, and certain practices that uh, you may be able to find a better way to uh, do them or to eliminate them altogether. Okay, we've got another question. Do you see organizations taking on development and deployment of P2P with internal resources? And if so, what are the pitfalls? Um, that's one I'll take. Um, typically, most of the, the larger retailers that are, are deploying P2P or looking to deploy at the moment will use um, software from a major supplier such as ACI, in, and in our instance, that's Postilion. Um, so typically, they'll be looking to the supplier to actually do a lot of development. But there, there are so many players involved. For example, you need to get your, your PED or POI, as PCI calls it. Uh, you, need, you need to speak to the vendor there, and they need to do specific developments. You need your host software provider to do all their developments. And also, as I mentioned earlier, there's a PCI P2P is typically 10% technical and 90% process. So a lot of your work will be in terms of compliance and getting your audit teams to go around and just validate everything and the ongoing compliance. So doing it in-house is, is probably an extremely challenging process to go through and you, you're probably better to talk to a, an outsourcer who's gone through it. You can go out there and find many vendors that offer P2P services out of the box. So doing it yourself is, is probably technically too challenging and your staff would probably like to be working on other projects that raise money. This one's typically seen as just a, um, a technical solution, but it is actually a, a business one as well. Okay, another question. Is the standard being actively pursued equally in different countries and territories? Do you want to take that one or not? I, I, not something I've had huge exposure to, but my understanding is that uh, the UK is pretty much at the forefront of P2PE in terms of interest and activity. Remembering what I said earlier, that of the 900 PSPs across the globe, we believe that only 20 are certified, are validated, and we do not know of any Tier 1 retailer who has. Um, in the US, there, there are different focuses on different methods of encryption. Um, but I do believe in APAC there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of wait and see as to what's going to unfold uh, in the Western markets before they make decisions. Uh, I'm certainly not aware of any discussions within our own business with anybody in APAC. Yeah, it does seem to be a, a very European, if not a very UK specific thing at the moment. Uh, my experience is that the Asians tend to be going towards more of a, um, I wouldn't say point-to-point -point encryption, more an end-to-end -end encryption. And the US guy is um, a little bit behind the curve as they were with EMV. So it does generally tend to be, a, a, to be honest, I think the UK is well ahead of the game. We seem to be, a, well, we've never seen a, a, a problem process that we don't like, and so we're getting on with it. Okay, next question. Are the US standards different? I understand that they do not include PET controls from a delivery perspective. Um, no, the US controls should be exactly the same. The, the P2P standard is, is a global one, so everything should be the same there. Next question. Do you see P2P being mandated for all merchants in the future? Can you tell that one, Mark? Yeah, and, and it actually ties well with another question that I have here, which is uh, now that you're starting to see Tier 1 merchants kick off P2PE projects, in your view, will acquirers also move, to, also move to offer P2PE on their terminal estates? Um, starting with that second question first, uh, pr probably not in the near term because uh, the focus isn't really on the tiers three and four at this point in time. It's very much at the, the upper end of the merchants. And I think until there's more penetration there, it won't drift up. That said, I think some acquirers, particularly those that are trying to expand their footprint out of their own uh, domain, and I'm thinking primarily of the US-based uh, who are moving into other jurisdictions, they certainly have a keen interest in the concept I don't think they've quite figured out how they're going to make it work yet. Uh, but anybody who's trying to globalize a product across multiple jurisdictions, 
I think it would be an attractive way to get the upper hand as you move into new territories. Uh, in terms of it being mandated, uh, I, I think that's probably some way away. Uh, obviously, PCI has been mandated, and I think acquirers are getting much more rigid on that. Uh, I think the financial benefits associated with that from both the acquirer and from the merchant point of view uh, will spill over into the P2PE environment in the fullness of time, but I would suggest it's still a few years away. And, and it's back to, to the earlier question we were asked about how long is the validated period. Well, we kind of don't know. We believe it's three years, but because there's so few validated solutions out there, it may take a while to evolve as to exactly what rigidity there is to that three-year window. Okay, we've got one final question. Uh, what's the typical pricing models offered from the validated solution providers? Is it priced based on the volume of PEDs? So I'll take that one. So um, from a PSP perspective, and there are a few of those emerging at the moment, yes, it is volume-based. Uh, obviously, they have a high level of cost. Typically, um, they will offer um, a P2P out of a box. And from my experience, you'll be looking probably 20 pounds and above per PED, and that will probably typically be based on a minimum of 1,000 devices. Anything to add to that, Mark? No, I think that's I think that's about right. Okay, I haven't seen any further questions. So thank you very much, and I'll, I'll hand back to Dennis. Okay, thank you very much, Mark and John, for a really clear exposition of the PP, P2P validation process. Uh, with lots of practical guidance there. Um, I hope all of you have also found it informative and thought-provoking, and above all, useful. And if you didn't manage to absorb all of the information, don't worry, it's been recorded and a link will go out tomorrow, so you can review it at your leisure. I'm sure Mark and John will be happy to follow up on any questions which weren't answered today. We do have a record of all those that uh, have been put through. I see a couple more popping in at the moment, but we'll, we'll deal with those uh, after the uh, webinar. So don't forget to keep in touch with what's happening at the Payments Knowledge Forum via the website at the pkf.org. Watch out for emails with further announcements about our informal summer networking event in central London during August. And of course, our annual conference on the 3rd and 4th of October. Thank you all for attending. Goodbye.